Dr. Paola Sandroni is a prof professor of neurology and director of the Autonomic Lab at Mayo Clinic's Rochester, Minnesota campus. We are grateful for her the time and talent Dr. Sandroni has shared with Dysautonomy International as one of our founding medical advisory board members. A respected physician and researcher, she has authored over 100 journal articles and book chapters on autonomic pain and peripheral nerve disorders and is one of the leading experts on multiple system atrophy and Parkinson's associated dysautonomia, which she will be presenting on this evening. Welcome, Dr. Sandroni, and thank you. Well, thank you, everyone, and thank you, Dr. Cook, for allowing me to switch. I uh, totally got lost with Eastern time and Central time, and thank you all for being here. I can't believe that we have 600 participants. So much for the fact that people don't want to go online um, anyway. I'm going to cover today the topic of central autonomic disorder for a change. Um, and let me get to my slides. And can I get someone to give me a thumbs up that everything looks cool and dandy? It looks great, thank you. Okay, so <clears throat> this is a big topic, and uh, um, so I'll give you my little spin and try to be uh, simple and practical, because I don't know any other way to practice. But I don't have anything to uh, disclose, uh, maybe some uh, off-label medication uh, will be discussed. So what are these synucleinopathies? This is a big family of uh, disorders that Include, uh, in encompass four main categories. One is the multiple system atrophy, which is the top of the pyramid for autonomic disorder. Then we have diffuse Lewy body disease and Parkinson's disease. All these three have motor manifestation besides autonomic symptoms. And then we have pure autonomic failure, which I see it in my mind as the purest form of autonomic failure, as the name implies, and is the equivalent to the autonomic system, uh, let's say, of what uh, Lou Gehrig disease is for the motor system or Alzheimer disease is for the cognitive uh, uh, system. The, there is a big overlap, needless to say. Uh, MSA has Parkinsonism and cerebellar ataxia, often in combination, plus autonomic failure. Diffuse Lewy body disease has dementia, Parkinsonism, hallucination. All of them will have RAIN behavior disorder and autonomic dysfunction. But Lewy body disease kind of position itself halfway between Parkinson and MSA. And then we have Parkinson disease that as a, a group, uh, autonomic involvement is the one with the least uh, uh, severity level. However, um, there is a big vari variability within this group. So some patient um, actually has a fairly prominent autonomic uh, dysfunction. And because they are the most common, if you see a patient with Parkinsonism and autonomic dysfunction, if you just have to guess, you're gonna guess Parkinson because simply because they are 100 times more common than anything else. They may have some dementia, which usually is late, and they're the ones that are characterized by the best response to levodopa of all. Now, here we have the pathologic uh, findings that we have in this patient, uh, the Lewy body signature that we see here, and here are the glial, glial cytoplasmic inclusion typical of these conditions as well. Um, Parkinson's disease is the most common, as I said, and although the motor manifestation usually dominates the clinical picture, no motor uh, symptoms and signs have become increasingly recognized as playing a critical roles in the patient quality of life. And this includes not only autonomic symptoms, but sleep disturbances, mood disorder, sleep disorder, etc. Autonomic dysfunction is a well-known non-motor manifestation with multi-system involvement in various degrees of severity. The autonomic involvement in these four syndromes 
results from distinct pattern of abnormal alpha synuclein aggregation throughout the central and peripheral autonomic networks. These pathologic hallmarks of Parkinson and diffuse Lewy body are the Lewy bodies and the neurites. And in MSA are oligodendroglial cytoplasmic inclusion and in pure autonomic failure are the peripheral neuronal cytoplasmic inclusion. But definitely there is a big overlap and depending upon when you catch a patient and if the patient obviously passes on and so you do autopsy, you may find a different uh, level of uh, um, distribution of all these inclusions. Now, you all know probably the complex um, central autonomic network that has multiple layer. Uh, if we start from the top, the top of the pyramid again in the anterior cingulate cortex and the insular cortex that involved, are involved in behavioral arousal, interoceptive awareness, emotion and stress responses, as well as homeostasis. Then we have the amygdala and the hypothalamus again, all involved in that, as well as an integration of autonomic function with arousal and pain modulation. And in, for that uh, specific function, also the periaqueductal gray in the brainstem is involved. Then we have barrington nucleus, perebrachial nuclei, and all the brainstem structure that uh, is really autonomic capital of uh, the brain, really. Where we have uh, the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus, the nucleus of the solitary tract, the ventral atra medulla, rostral and caudal, the medullary raphe, the nucleus ambiguous, that are pretty much involved in everything autonomic ranging from blood pressure, respiration, circulation, micturition, and gastrointestinal function. And they modulate sleep, by the way, as part of all of this. And then we go down to the spinal cord, where we have um, <clears throat> the intermediate lateral column and the sacral um, uh, structure that are involved in the segmental, sympathetic, and parasympathetic at the sacral level. Uh, reflexes for micturition, defecation, and erection, and whatnot. So let's start from the top. The involvement of the insular cortex in Parkinson's disease has been related to non-motor symptoms, including autonomy dysfunction and arousal. Accumulation of alpha synuclein in the left posterior insula has been correlated to the presence of orthostatic hypotension. The anterior cingulate project to the anterior insula as well as to subcortical autonomic structures and modulate autonomic responses depending on the behavioral state. Sub and pregenual portions are associated with cardiovascular responses, while the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex is associated with sympathetic activation triggered by behavioral arousal. The amygdala is involved in prodromal diffusely body uh, the disease, but its correlation with autonomic dysfunction has not been fully elucidated. The hypothalamus is really um, at the center of all this network and indeed is so important that it is probably in the most protected area of the brain. And so it's damaged only when there are devastating injuries to the brain. Um, there are multiple areas in the hypothalamus, the dorsal medial nuclei are more still involved in sympato activation in response to cold and various stressors. The lateral hypothalamic area involved in sympato excitation due to behavioral arousal. The anterior and preoptic area is, um, has heat sensitive neurons. They are the ones that are activated uh, when we need to sweat. So with heat loss responses and uh, the presence of a Lewy body in the hypothalamus that has been documented in Parkinson's disease is what really is responsible for the disorder in thermoregulation for these patients, um, that they may complain uh, variably of difficulty tolerating heat uh, or cold or both. The brainstem, again, there are many, many, many structures. Uh, the periaqueductal gray, the, pontine, uh, the pontine A5, adrenergic area, the ventral lateral medulla, the raphe, they control micturition, wakefulness, cardiovascular and cardiorespiratory manifestation. Their involvement is maximal in multiple system atrophy, but is also present in diffusely body disease and in Parkinson's degrees to a lesser degree. 
the dorsal uh, motor nucleus of the vagus is uh, the um, origin of the preganglionic vagal innervation and mediates, um, it's mediated by the inter enteric nervous system at the gut level in the postganglionic uh, branch. Now, this is extremely important because it's involved very early in, uh, in Parkinson's disease, sometimes even before motor manifestations are recognized. The nucleus ambiguous is relatively spared in Lewy body disorders, but is affected in multiple system atrophy. Um, so uh, this regulation of uh, respiration is much more common in MSA than in Lewy body. Now let's go to the peripheral structures. The peripheral structures are quite uh, extensive, as you can imagine. We have the enteric nervous system and the autonomic ganglia. These are largely spared in MSA, at least in earlier stages, but it's affected quite early in uh, diffusory body disease and particularly in Parkinson's disease. The Bragg's hypothesis is that alpha-synuclein deposit starts in the enteric nervous system and spreads to the central structures via the vagus. And actually they had plenty of uh, data to show that. And it, and then we have the rostrocaudal gradient from the submandibular gland down to the rectum, which corresponds to the parasympathetic uh, side branch of all this. So corresponds to the vagal innervation from a dorsal motor of the vagus, uh, but does not parallel neuronal loss. It's just that these structures have been um, crucial in being uh, tested early to really detect disease. And that's where really most of the research has been done in terms of early detection of this condition. Early enteric nervous system involvement explains why constipation oftentimes precedes Parkinson disease diagnosis by several years. Now, we all know that unfortunately, or fortunately, whichever way you want to look at it, constipation is extremely common and has multiple factors. So it's hard to say, oh, you have constipation, you may be developing Parkinson's disease, but you should keep it on the back of your mind. Upper GI symptoms are explained by enteric nervous system involvement, uh, receiving vagal input from the uh, dorsal motor uh, nucleus of the vagus. Um, peripheral neurons, so we have the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. So with the sympathetic, we will have loss of fibers to the sweat glands, heart and blood vessels, Abnormal deposits are noted in skin biopsies as well as adrenal medulla. Unfortunately, um, there is a sampling error, so it's very difficult to say if I do a skin biopsy and I don't see anything, I don't find any synuclein deposition, can I exclude the pathology? Unfortunately not, you may simply have been lucky and get in a good area or depending which way you wanna look at, not lucky. And so, or there is again a very limited area of involvement and you just happen to sample a normal area. Uh, for the parasympathetic alpha-synuclein deposits in the cranial and sacral autonomic ganglia in Parkinson's disease. Now, here is a, um, a slide from uh, our colleague, Dr. Sorsimo, who um, looked at the involvement of uh, various central structures in uh, different synucleinopathies. And you look at the hypothalamus, periacudatal grave, anterior medulla, et cetera, et cetera. All these structures that we talked about in multiple system atrophy, Parkinson's disease and diffuse Lewy body disease and pure autonomic failure. Now you'll see that pretty much the big winner is multiple system atrophy. It's the um, super, super, super winner of the central autonomic disorder. So that shouldn't come as a surprise. <clears throat> Second comes Parkinson disease and diffusory body disease. And again, Parkinson disease depends. As I said, there is a quite a bit of variability <clears throat> excuse me, in these patients. So some may be more, much more affected than others. And you can see that they all have some involvement. And the nucleus that seems to be most uh, commonly hit and most severely is indeed the nucleus of the motor, uh, I mean, the, yeah, the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus, uh, as we just said, because it's the preganglionic branch of the enteric nervous system. In pure autonomic failure, you will have none of these necessarily affected. 
If you go to the peripheral side, now things change dramatically. Uh, now you may wonder, why do we have a yes, no question mark? Well, depends on what stage of MSA you uh, check the patient. As I said at the beginning, they won't have peripheral involvement, but as the disease progresses, they will. So some involvement will be translated in the periphery as well. While in Parkinson's disease and diffuse Lewy body dementia, you'll have pretty substantial involvement of all this structure from the get-go. And in pyrotonomic failure, you will have also quite a bit of involvement, uh, particularly of the sympathetic structures more than the parasympathetic, actually. So in summary, Lewy body pathology starts early in the periphery and moves centrally, while in multiple system atrophy, the brand of the pathology is central and move, uh, oops, uh, sorry about this, I must have lost a piece of my sentence, and move peripherally later as the disease progresses. So what are the clinical criteria? This uh, is a consensus that was, uh, it was a second iteration of this uh, um, consensus for multiple system atrophy. Um, and we have, it's a sporadic, progressive adult onset. We used to say above 40, now we're saying above 30. Disease characterized by autonomic failure. And this is really a key component of the diagnosis. Not any autonomic failure, has to be orthostatic hypotension of pretty significant degree, or neurogenic bladder that cannot be explained by local pathology or anything else. Um, then must have some form of motor involvement, either Parkinsonism that is poorly levodopa responsive, and it's generally a um, rigid form. So there isn't much tremor, generally speaking, in multiple system atrophy. And then there could be cerebellar dysfunction. Now you may have the C type, so cerebellar dysfunction comes earlier than the P type, which is the Parkinsonian syndrome form but eventually they all will progress. And so the patient will have both. Um, the cerebellar is a typical cerebellar dysfunction type with gait ataxia, dysarthria, limb ataxia, et cetera. The definite MSA, technically speaking, is only possible diagnosis after autopsy. Uh, probable, you must have autonomic failure and P or C. Possible is when you have Parkinson or cerebellar dysfunction, and at least uh, one features of autonomic instability and some additional features, which usually are brain behavior disorders, strider, um, poor doppler responsive, et cetera, et cetera. So a bunch of other things. So how do we diagnose these folks? When you see them in a full-blown stage, it's not difficult. The key is usually to say, okay, when I see a patient in front of me, looks Parkinsonian or looks like has an ataxia or has autonomic dysfunction, maybe there is some motor involvement. How do I know? Sometimes it's not so easy. Sometimes it's just an issue of this is what it is now. I'm going to see the patient back in six months. Like, again, same for motor neuron disease. You cannot diagnose it today, but you're convinced that that's what it is doesn't fulfill all the criteria, get the patient back in six months. Um, the thing is that's been most uh, interesting for us is not only recognizing MSA by itself, but also identifying patients with pure autonomic failure that have actually a risk of converting to a multiple system atrophy. The prognosis of the two conditions is quite different. Um, patient with pure autonomic failure can live quite a number of years. I had patients that I'd follow for 15, 20 years, actually. Yes, they have a limitation, but uh, we can keep them alive and most of them still function. Not so for MSA. So there were a bunch of different studies done and we looked at various parameters and uh, without going into the weeds, but basically, there are two factors that seem to be most important in predicting conversion to multiple system atrophy. If you have a patient what, that has what looks like their autonomic failure. One is uh, supinorepinephrine greater than 100 picogram for ML. Why? Because pure autonomic failure usually has less than that. 
if it's higher number means that it's a preganglionic form, so more likely MSA. And severe bladder dysfunction. What's interesting to us all um, is the fact that, for instance, REM behavior disorder doesn't appear to be a predictor, which in my mind seems counterintuitive because if I have REM behavior disorder, I automatically think that there is brainstem dysfunction and thus a central process. I don't have an explanation yet. Maybe I'll have one hopefully in years to come. Why is it important to recognize this patient early? Well, we don't have disease-modifying therapies right now, but when we will, hopefully soon, then it's important to recognize who is the highest risk and monitor them more closely. Plus, it's important, obviously, to tell the patient what to expect. In terms of survival, this is a, a we have looked at patients with the multiple system atrophy type P and C. Um, we weren't sure. Actually, clinically, we kind of discussed among ourselves. Um, I thought the patient with type C in my patient population was worse than the type P. Bottom line is there is no difference. Once you have MSA, the survival is exactly identical. And uh, the 50% um, point is about eight years really. So of course now we have more techniques, some more medicine to keep them alive, recognize them sooner, uh, but still it's a deadly disease. There is no uh, sugar coating this. Uh, what are the clinical manifestations? Well, I'm going to center on Parkinson because everything really uh, stems one way or another, but that's really the middle um, number. Up to 50% plus of patients with Parkinson's disease will have symptoms of orthostatic hypotension, as opposed to about 16% of age match control. If you have MSA, if usually body disease or PAF, the number is high. Interestingly enough, the genetic forms, if there is Lewy body pathology, there is autonomic dysfunction. Otherwise, like in Parkinson type two, the profile is normal. Now, these manifestations can be clinically asymptomatic and we need to be still careful and recognize it because can worsen still the patient uh, functional capacity or safety. Um, the fact that they don't realize that they are fainting is not necessarily good because they cannot protect themselves. Key features, cerebral hypoperfusion, postprandial effect, medication can amplify the abnormality and of course, they worsen as the disease progresses, but this could be multifactorial because as the disease progresses, they are less active, uh, the volume status may change, they may need more medication that can, again, technically worsen orthostatic hypotension. Um, they may have supine hypertension as well as exercise-induced hypotension. There are some malignant form of Parkinson's disease that have more, um, uh, cognitive dysfunction and orthostatic hypotension. How do they correlate? Well, it's possible that um, more hypotension may cause, first of all, obviously there is no blood going to the brain, so they may, the brain may not function that well, but they may have also low-grade gradual chronic ischemic changes. So the management of orthostatic hypotension, you probably heard it uh, through the uh, course but again, if you like um, mnemonics, the ABCD is a good way to go. Uh, Modify from the paper from Dr. Figueroa, abdominal binder and compressive garments, uh, bolus water treatment, which boosts uh, blood pressure <clears throat> starting about 15, 20 minutes after the ingestion of the water and can stay up for about an hour. So good for... Um, activities like the patient needs to go and do grocery shopping or something like that. Head of the bed elevated, physical counter maneuvers to improve uh, um, blood return to the heart. Medications. We only have few drugs available at the moment. Midodrine, that's a vasoconstricting, so raises the blood pressure. Florin F, that volume expand them. Pyridostigmine, the, which enhances ganglionic transmission, works technically better for the preganglionic forms, but try it anyway. I've been surprised. Droxidopa, 
And uh, there is a new drug that probably will be approved uh, soon. There are some encouraging data, which is atomoxetine. Um, educate the patient to recognize the subtle symptoms of uh, early falls and recognize orthostatic stressor and increase fluid and salt intake. If they have supine hypertension, again, head of the bed up should be sufficient. Sometimes an eye cap um, will do the trick, uh, reduce floor in F is necessary, or use a short acting medication just at night. Very important to reduce supine hypertension because long term cause uh, renal failure. The next big thing is the gastrointestinal manifestation, which is probably the most prominent in the Parkinson patient, actually. In the upper GI symptoms, there will often reduce the saliva, pro saliva production, although patients will complain of salorrhea, but that's not because there is too much production. It's because they have infrequent or ineffective swallowing, and so this, the saliva pools in the mouth and eventually spills over. Gastroparesis, patient will have nausea, vomiting, early satiety, bloating, loss of appetite, that unfortunately is worsened by levodopa. Um, as well as the nausea. Dysphagia is due to oropharyngeal as well as esophageal dysmotility. So the patient will have difficulty swallowing pills, they will have trouble with coughing, prolonged chewing, and that creates a whole other host of issues. From a lower GI standpoint, the big winner is constipation that's present in 90% of the patient of par with Parkinson disease and certainly also with all the other synucleinopathy. And they may have a pseudo-ostruction pattern. So careful with that. Don't send the patient to surgery. Um, from a dysphagia, important to evaluate that with uh, um, an official swallow evaluation, that examine everything and observe the patient while they eat and drink. Um, video fluoroscopy is important because it really gives you a sense how well the patient handles that and also allows to train the patient on how to do so more, um, I mean, to be safer without choking and without having aspiration. Um, and doing that with the video, it's really very, very important. In terms of what to do for the upper GI symptoms, really a lot of it relies on postural and behavioral changes during meals, as well as modifying meals consistency. Um, there are, again, when you do the video assisted swallowing, you can do some training of the expiratory muscles so the patient improves the whole mechanic. If the salaria is really a big problem, um, the only option probably is Botox because unfortunately other drugs to reduce that would be anticholinergics that will worsen a whole lot of all the other autonomic symptoms. Um, and you can do that in the salivary gland as well as the distal esophagus. Eventually, patient will require feeding tube. There are a variety of promotivity agents available, but most of it are cholinergic enhancers, serotonin agonists, motilin receptor agonists, and dopamine that are really dopamine blockers. So for any patient, particularly with Parkinson, that's the most specific, you don't want to use those drugs. For the other um, synucleinopathies, you can try, but the Efficacy and side effects, it's really, most of the time you don't come up ahead, that is the patient doesn't come up ahead. Um, regarding the discussion about feeding tube, obviously it's a personal choice, but we definitely recommend it when the patient is losing weight or the patient is very frustrated because it takes forever to finish a meal. Um, and then the, the caregiver gets frustrated. So the patient becomes dehydrated or then they have a hard time <clears throat> in taking medications. So we stress the point that that should actually be seen as a convenience and the patient can still have oral intake but can focus on the things that they enjoy the most. They could have a piece of chocolate or whatever without having to stress, oh my God, I need to put in 2000 calories and it's gonna take me six hours to chew it. Let's go to the lower uh, gastrointestinal tract. So we have the colon that is mostly regarding water absorption and transit. And then we have the uh, descending uh, colon that's mostly conduit, and then the sigmoid and the rectum that are volitional reservoir. Um, constipation, needless to say, is common and it's particularly 
common in the elderly and due, is due to inactivity, inappropriate diet, depression, multiple medication, neuromuscular disorder, poor rectal sensation, evacuation, dynamics, impaction, pelvic floor dysfunction, you name it. A lot of different things. What do you do with that? Well, um, a lot of it, again, is lifestyle changes, dietary modification, probiotics, exercise, fluids, et cetera, bulk laxative, or modic laxative, stimulant, suppositories, activators like lumiproston, et cetera. Now, there are a lot of all those drugs they are listed. Some of those are very expensive. Some are not quite yet approved. Um, but those are definitely option. I will not prescribe them myself without the blessing of a gastroenterologist personally and without having done a full transit study and checking things through. Now, oftentimes the patient complains both of constipation or diarrhea. Most commonly is the, the diarrhea happens because there is either overflow from obstruction and so there is a bacterial overgrowth and then eventually explodes. Um, other times could be truly a combination, and that becomes very difficult, particularly because a lot of these patients will have fecal incontinence. Um, patients with these syndromes will have uh, pelvic floor dysenergia. So you needed to educate them, um, have them have regular bowel habits, sanitary devices. Pelvic floor retraining can work up to a point. If it's really bad, sometimes they can do surgery to put sling around the sphincter, um, the rectal sphincter. Those are really extreme cases. How about fecal incontinence, et cetera? Time, patience, et cetera. Um, educate the patients, have them identify if there are specific triggers, um, try to go to the toilet promptly when uh, they feel there is uh, um, the need to go and avoid suppressing the urge, which is something they oftentimes do, either because they are fearful of not getting there on time and you can hardly blame them, but that uh, really perpetuate the problem of the pelvic floor dysfunction. And then you can work with uh, uh, regulating bowel habits, sometimes with over-the-counter medications such as milk of magnesia and whatnot. Um, when they complain of the fecal incontinence, again, query them about the abuse of laxative use, if there is a rectal impaction that has not been recognized, or if there is an evacuation disorder, again, with a pelvic floor dysfunction. There are maybe a passive incontinence, particularly for small pebbles, particularly older women with weak sphincters. Um, if there is an abnormal anorectal test and is consistent with evacuation disorder, send the patient to pelvic floor retraining, it can really make a difference. Um, if they are unable to uh, evacuate, then they will need the suppositories, and enemas, and um, uh, give them stimuli to, to facilitate the process. What about diarrhea? Well, again, make sure there isn't anything else going on. The biggest thing is generally bacterial overgrowth. Um, in terms of management, look at what they're eating and particularly what they're drinking. Um, a lot of sodas contain a lot of sorbitol and fructose, and of course, caffeine, it's a big stimulant. And then you can play with medication, but particularly things like amitriptyline and clonidine, um, guess what that is going to do with their orthostatic hypotension uh, problem and everything else. So the fewer meds you can use, the better. Um, and then there again, there are some very fancy drugs such as allocetron, which unfortunately is very expensive. And uh, uh, modulating anal pressure, but again, it's really difficult in this patient because of the fact you create, you fix one problem, but worse than some of the others. So the more you can go non-pharmacologically or with non-absorbed medication, the better. Um, Gentle urinary manifestation is present in 50% of the Parkinson cases, pretty much 100% eventually of multiple system atrophy and diffuse way body disease patients. Sometimes it's difficult to know if it's specific or it's related to age-related pathology or idiopathic forms that can be present in otherwise normal subject. Most common uh, um, symptoms are of course frequency, nocturia, 
And the nocturia is worsened by the fact that this patient may have supine hypertension that creates um, and promotes a diuresis. Urgency, incontinence are the most common. Some other patients may have mainly issues with voiding and incomplete emptying. But remember that essentially the bladder can only do two things, empty and, and maintain. So eventually when you have both failure, the patient will need a, um, uh, either uh, an, an implanted uh, catheter, suprapubic, which is now not very popular, or um, in and out cath. What about erectile dysfunction? Compared to age match control, Parkinson subjects are three times more likely to develop Parkinson disease with other um, systemic causes excluded. Um, for multiple system atrophy patient, the number is through the roof, needless to say. There are five centers that control uh, voiding, urinary voiding. Uh, the higher brain function is really more the social continence. Then we have the on-time nutrition center. Then the, we have the onus nucleus in the core that promotes storage. The parasympathetic nerves pr uh, promotes voiding. And again, uh, as I was saying before, the bladder only has to function storage and empty. Um, now, what are the normal parameters? There is a huge var range of uh, variability. We all know that you might go to the bathroom twice a day with a similar amount of fluid intake, your next uh, neighbor will go six times. Uh, let's say the normal numbers are about six, seven times a day if you have a pretty normal fluid intake. And the amount of volumes voided is between 250 and 600 cc. Um, the first sensation most of the time is between 100 and 150. The actual, the presence of sensation is more important than the volume actually, which is felt because it gives you enough warning. And then um, the post vital residual should be less than 50. But there is, as I said, there are large variations. So don't jump at the number if you see a urodynamic study. It's really putting all this together. So how do you treat an overactive bladder, which is generally speaking, the first um, symptoms of uh, dysfunction? Behavioral strategies with fluid schedule, if there is treat, uh, pelvic floor dysfunction treated, oftentimes they comes together with a constipation, timed and prompted voiding, and use absorbent garments for um, uh, comfort and avoid embarrassment. Medication, unfortunately, they're all anti-muscarinic, so <clears throat> they will have other side effects uh, from an autonomic standpoint that are negative. Um, some of the newer agents are less offensive, but they all do pretty much the same thing. But if you have to use it, well, you got to use it. Just be sensible. Um, this is an example of a urodynamic uh, study. Um, and this is the, the, the pattern of urgency. Uh, we all, when you have a feeling of you got to go, you feel it, but you can suppress it the patient with the urgency will have bigger contraction and they cannot really control it. So always evaluate post-vital residual because that's another big issue in terms of creating um, incontinence. Uh, again, for urgency and retention, there are medication, as I said, for both, but unfortunately all these drugs will have the side effect that will worsen orthostatic hypotension. Next uh, complaint is uh, the inability to sweat, which the patient doesn't complain they don't sweat. They complain they cannot tolerate heat. Um, universally, patient with MSA will have global anhydrosis eventually. About uh, a third <clears throat> to half of the patient with Parkinson will have sweat abnormalities, but they usually have a more peripheral type pattern, like a neuropathic uh, type pattern. I mean, peripheral neuropathy, that's what I mean. And they may complain of hyperhidrosis, which is compensatory in the upper body, but also is oftentimes associated with dyskinesia. Um, they might complain of heat intolerance, as I said. If you look as a group, multiple system atrophy patient has a much larger area of anhydrosis than patient with Parkinson disease. Next, the sleep problem. So they have a variety of 
uh, sleep disorder, all these patients with the synucleinopathy. Uh, insomnia, central hypersomnia, parasomnia, which is the RAIN behavior disorder, breathing disorder are very important. Why are we focusing on this? Because the patient, if you don't recognize the strider, the patient will die of hyperventilation in their sleep. Um, so as soon as you uh, are told by the uh, bed partners that the patient not only stop breathing, but they have strider, then it's time to probably uh, have a tracheostomy. Um, and some of these patients may have it during the day. They may not have classic strider, but they may have periodically while they breathe, they may have like a deep sigh, which is, again, they are hypoventilating and so they're catching up. Ram behavior disorder, it's a uh, more problem for the bad partners generally, but can be uh, bad enough that the patient can injure themselves. The drug of choice is melatonin or clonazepam. They're both equally effective, but side effect wise, clonazepam has many more side effects because the patient is sleepy, unsteady, dizzy, et cetera, et cetera, as you see here. Um, sometimes it's simply simpler if the patient can do that. Just put the mattress just flat on the floor, no uh, furniture around, and the bed partner sleeps in another room. That's probably the safest thing. And then we have dysarthria in MSA. They may have all kinds of dysarthria, hypokinetic, spastic, ataxic, in any combination. Hypokinetic is usually breathy, imprecise, short rushes, the typical Parkinson patient. Um, very important to uh, manage that. It's very frustrating for a person not to be able to communicate. There are many strategies that can be implemented to improve intelligibility. And then once the speech is beyond being uh, um, trainable or retrainable, there are other technologies now that can augment uh, eff effective communication. Um, Let's forget that. There is, again, a bunch of different ways that we can test this patient to differentiate. Is that Parkinson? Is that PAF? Is that MSA? Uh, different uh, catecholamine level uh, will indicate different level of abnormalities. Again, this is uh, the metabolite in the plasma of the catecholamines. The lowest level is pure autonomic failure. Again, they will have the lowest level of all group. Parkinson will be halfway through. An MSA will be actually in the normal range. Uh, in terms of imaging, cardiac imaging, um, patient with multiple system atrophy will have a normal cardiac imaging because it's a central pathology, at least again, until they become so severe that also the postganglionic branch is affected. While Parkinson's disease, a pure autonomic failure, will have abnormalities that will indicate the peripheral process. Uh, you will never see a PAF with a normal cardiac scan. So if you have the opportunity to do that, that would be something that you can help. But honestly, we don't use it very often. And with that, I am at 45 minutes and I will stop here and see if there are any questions. All right, thank you so much for that wonderful lecture. We do have some questions. Um, for those of you who are wanting to participate participate in the live Q&A, um, click on the Q&A button down below and type your questions and we can get to them if we have time. Um, so let me see. So our first question for you, Dr. Sandroni, is how do you typically handle a patient who presents with dysautonomia and muscle weakness, in which autonomic um, sinucopathy is muscle, sorry, <laughs> is muscle weakness most common? Uh, more than muscle weakness per se is the fact that patient has no muscle control. So if you actually test that strength, they are normal, um, but they cannot use it because one, they cannot control it well from a purely motor programming standpoint, or because they have orthostatic hypotension. So when they get up and start to walk or whatever they try to do, there is no fuel going to the brain. And so they feel that they have no energy. And in fact, it's as if you're trying to run a car on fumes. Um, there is no, no energy. So 
the key is try to understand which one is the key, the main driver, and there may be more than one. Um, and so you have to work accordingly. Unfortunately for MSA, um, I mean, for any other sinucleinopathy except for Parkinson disease, the uh, treatment with levodopa is, the benefit is transient usually and marginal. While in patients with Parkinson, the benefit is substantial. So that fixes one component, which is a purely motor aspect. You're still left with the autonomic instability. So you need to work on the blood pressure. Okay, thank you. Are there different types of dysautonomia that can impair the sense of pain and temperature only for short time periods and then at other moments make the patients hypersensitive? From a pain standpoint, no. Yeah. Um, it's uh, usually more indirectly. I mean, whatever is causing the pain may also alter autonomic function. So as uh, the colleague was saying before, if you are in a hyperadrenergic state, chances are your pain threshold changes. And interestingly enough, you cannot predict which way necessarily go. Um, the example I usually use is think about the football players, right? They hit themselves and you just watch and you say, Ooh, oh God, this is dead, right? Yeah. How can I get up and play the next uh, play like nothing mm -hmm. happened? If it happens to you and me, we'll be in bed for a week, you know, with Tylenol and, and ibuprofen. In their case, the endorphin and the surge of catecholamine because of the excitement of the game make them overcome the pain. The next day, they will be totally crushed. They will need to go in the ice bucket and sit there because, again, at that point, the pain comes up. So it's really... There is some modulation, but it's probably more um, global, not directly from the autonomic to the pain, unless you have complex regional pain syndrome, okay. Perfect. Um, in the outpatient clinic, what is the importance of transcranial Doppler and the diagnosis of different types of dysautonomia? No, we don't use transcranial Doppler for that. Um, we use it only actually, um, in research, it's very impractical in clinic, um, and it's more for uh, orthostatic hypotension because a patient with uh, even severe orthostatic hypotension, like the MSA patient, evolve very slowly. They may have a significant um, adaptation with uh, cerebral autoregulation. So even if the blood pressure drops, there is still blood flow to the brain. So th the issue is. What's the correlation? I mean, it's not one-to-one, -one, how much the pressure drops and how much blood flow to the brain drops. So that would be the only value to do it, but not in uh, dysautonomia if we, if we use the term dysautonomia, particularly for thoughts. Perfect. Um, is MSA with loss of muscle control a diagnosis or process of elimination? Does it ever happen in younger folks in their 20s? No, no. If, as I said before, uh, under age 30 is, uh, it's, no, you cannot diagnose this. And actually you will really say it will be the wrong diagnosis and something else is going on. Uh, I mean, MSA is no joke. Uh, MSA is not subtle. Uh, there is truly big time hard data to show that there is autonomic instability and there is a significant, and it's not weakness. We're talking Parkinsonian syndrome. We're talking cerebellar syndrome. It's not just I'm weak, I'm fatigued. No, 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 no. It, it's really, there is a lot on the exam of a patient with multiple system atrophy. You have a lot of findings. Um, if I have a patient with dysautonomia, clinically on my general neuro exam, I find nothing or this much. Okay, okay. Uh, do you recommend urodynamics for autonomic patients with urinary urgency or in, or sorry, urinary urgency? Does this help identify or clarify the type of dysautonomia the patient may have? No, I do that only um, if I really suspect neurogenic bladder. Um, I usually do post-white residual in a lot of patients because that's a very common thing. And pelvic floor dysfunction is incredibly common. So I test for that a lot. 
uh, that's usually is my number one that I find diagnosis in patients with dysautonomia and uh, bladder symptoms of any kind. Okay, can, uh, let's see. Um, can PAF cause loss of muscle use and symptoms no. on all five ANA symptoms? Okay. Systems, sorry. All five what? Systems. I think they meant autonomic systems. Oh, autonomic, yes. Your autonomic failure, by definition, affects everything. So uh, blood pressure, bladder, bowel, sweating, sexual function, yes. Um, does not affect anything else. It's a really a super clean, as pure as it can be, really, syndrome. Um, the, yes, of course, once the, the orthostatic hypotension it's hard to control. The patient may complain of fatigue because again, we're back that there is no blood going to the brain, but they have no motor deficit whatsoever, no motor programming problem whatsoever. I mean, it's really amazing how functioning actually this patient can be once you fix your blood pressure. Perfect. Um, we got time for a couple more. Do you ever find upper motor neuron signs on exam in central dysautonomias? Uh, dysautonomia, again, not, I mean, I find it in multiple system atrophy, although actually, um, let's say, upgoing toes, for instance, Babinski, which is what we usually look for, it's actually rare, even in Parkinson's, in um, and multiple system atrophy, even if they have pyramidal symptoms. Uh, in all the other dysautonomia, no. Um, is there any utility for tilt training in the context of the Parkinson's disease or MSA? Maybe at the beginning. Um, depends how advanced the patient is. Uh, we try all we can from a non-pharmacological standpoint. The challenges with those patients is because they also have the motor difficulties Teaching them, for instance, physical counter maneuver can be truly difficult. Um, we can still try the, the tilt training though, yes. Is there any research that shows pineal gland tumors are associated with dysautonomia? Actually, no. Uh, the pineal is uh, really a unique uh, structure and it's mostly if I have less, I mean, pineal cysts are very common, for instance, and those are irrelevant. The only time when we may have neurologic findings is if there is a true pineal tumor. And usually there are symptoms more of eye movement, irregularity, and the sleep pattern, but no autonomia unless the patient develops hydrocephalus, in which case then all bets are off. No, but that's a very interesting structure. Um, surprisingly, it does not cause much. Okay. Can sacral neurostimulation devices, for example, interstim, help with constipation or inconsistent symptoms or incontinence symptoms? I'm sorry. Um, yes, as long as um, the patient has a preserved sensation. So um, if the patient has, let's say, difficulty voiding or has incontinence, but they can sense and they just cannot do the appropriate uh, motor part, then this interstim is, uh, can work. If there is no sensation, then no, actually it's one of the contraindications. Um, so generally when the patient is considered for interstim, we need to do very careful testing, definitely with urodynamic, definitely do a pelvic floor, um, an orectal manometry and the pelvic floor assessment. So ruling out um, pelvic floor dysfunction and, uh, and making sure the patient have enough sensation. Otherwise it's a disaster. Okay. How often do you test female POTS patients for Fabry? Just with POTS, never. If they have uh, some clear documented evidence of small fiber dysfunction, um, or something more like erythromelangia-like things, or 
if they have a family member, male that's affected and they may be a carrier, I check for it. I have never seen just POTS as a fabric carrier. Usually, if they are symptomatic carrier, um, the biggest issue is usually pain. Okay. Do you see high C1Q binding in AAG? Do I see, I'm sorry, what? It says C1Q binding in AAG. I wasn't sure what that was either. I was hoping yeah. you uh, Honestly, we have not seen that, but I don't know how often we test for it. I mean, if the patient clearly has an autoimmune ganglionopathy, uh, we look at for a neuroimmunology standpoint, not from a complement testing. Okay. Okay. And our last question is, is there any correlation between idiopathic intracranial hypertension and POTS? Hypertension? Yes. Hypertension was in the question. Yes. Mm, no, actually no. Um, Hypotension, yes. Uh, hypertension, I have never seen it. Okay. And usually it's a very different body habitus type population as well. Okay. One more question. Can transcranial magnetic stimulation help with dysautonomia? It's never been tested as such. Um, works for depression, works for a variety of psychiatric condition, works for pain, but is not approved for pain. Um, I don't think we have an answer, to be honest with you. There are a lot of newer devices that are portable, that are vagal nerve stimulator, wherever those probably will have a much bigger role than transcranial by itself. Transcranial is too broad. Transcranial works for things that you need globally to reset your brain, not if you have uh, like a more selective vagal or sympathetic dysfunction because you'll stimulate both equally. But there again, there is no clear data on that that I know of. Okay, okay. Well, Dr. Sandroni, I wanna thank you so greatly for your time. As always, your lecture was wonderful. Um, and thank you for taking the time to answer some questions with us this afternoon or this evening, depending on where you are. Um, so again, thank you. Uh, before I introduce our next speaker, Lauren Stiles is gonna come on um, and talk really quick. Uh, Lauren, the stage is yours. And thank you everybody. And congratulations again in absolutely incredible numbers. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you.